everyone and welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Elena and I am part of the Tunisia Democracy Connectors team. I will be moderating today's session. Um, with me on the moderation team is Antonia. She will be our technical moderator for today. Um, you will notice that um, you have been muted. Uh, there will be time to answer questions after the speakers finish. So please post any questions you have in the chat along with the name of who you want to ask the question to. And Antonia will read them aloud during our discussion round at the end. Uh, now, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to say some words about the project behind this webinar. Um, this webinar is the conclusion of a project that we have been working on for the past six months called the Tunisia Democracy Connectors. Uh, the project connect, uh, consisted of four trainees, uh, three of which are here today. Um, the topic of the project was to highlight the lived realities of uh, LGBTQ individuals in Tunisia, where democracy is in crisis and being queer is punishable with up to three years in prison. And now while the first three months of the project went according to plan and consisted of organizing events which took place in Cologne, the second part of our project went quite differently than we expected. Um, the original plan was to spend three months in Tunis. However, due to security concerns, it became evident that it was neither wise nor possible to do so. And so instead, we spent some weeks fundraising, and thanks to a number of donors, we were able to restructure our project and travel to Stockholm and Berlin, where we interviewed activists from different countries of the MENA region, um, living in exile, two of which are also here with us as speakers today. The resulting interviews were filmed and will be uploaded to Democracy International's YouTube channel in the coming days. And we really put a lot of passion and work into them. So we really hope you will check them out. Um, now to our speakers. Um, our first speaker is Halid Ghairi, who is part of the uh, Democracy Connectors team. Um, Khaled is a queer rights activist from Tunisia, um, where he worked with both our partner organization, IARF, the Intersection Association for Rights and Freedoms, and DAMJ, which is North Africa's oldest LGBT and human rights organization. Khaled will talk about the interviews that we conducted, as well as about the political and human rights situation in Tunisia today. Um, Khaled will then be followed by Caroline Benayen, who has been our mentor throughout this project and who will uh, who is responsible at Democracy International for public relations and global community building. She will talk about direct democracy and the tools of democracy, as well as about Democracy International as an organization, which most of you will probably already be familiar with. Then up next is Haifa Safa, who is one of the activists that granted us an interview in Sweden. Haifa is an activist and actress from Lebanon, um, has lived in Tunisia and Turkey, and we'll talk about the political as well as the situation of the civil society in Lebanon and the backlash of the terrorist attack on the LGBTQ society there. Then our fourth speaker is Hamza Nazri, who is a co-founder of our partner organization, IARF, and the second of our interviews present today. Hamza lives in Stockholm and will talk about IARF and one of IARF's most important projects, Freedom Faces. We also additionally have an expert with us from the academic realm, uh, Mr. Joseph Matthew de Bono from the University of Malta. Um, among his specialties is Tunisian democracy, and he has joined us on a very short notice. So thank you, Mr. de Bono, for being here today. Um, he will participate in the discussion and perhaps also be able to give us some additional insights into his work. And now, without any more delay, welcome to our first speaker, Halit. The stage is yours. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for this uh, introduction and thanks to everyone who joined us uh, today and was interested to hear about uh, our project and uh, the work we did. Um, Actually, like uh, this project and the interview 
it may seem big, but for me, it was somehow a life-changing um, experience, both uh, professionally and uh, personally. And as you mentioned, we couldn't conduct the second pay phase of uh, the, the project in Tunisia, unfortunately, as originally um, intended. But um, we can say we didn't give up <laughs> because the people who worked on the project on the, on the ground know all the circumstances around the, the project and how the project evolved from being in Tunisia to the second part in in Germany, and if I may share like some personal stuff, I, I still remember the day me and Elena walking on the streets and we came up with this brilliant um, idea, if I may call it brilliant, <laughs> to interview activists um, in, uh, in exile. And um, yeah, here is the idea coming to, uh, to be a uh, reality now. So of course, uh, due to timing and various circumstances, the project didn't go as smoothly as we had hoped that uh, that the project go. However, considering it was our first attempt uh, with le like three months to for preparation um, and execution for the project, I can say that um, I'm satisfied and content with uh, what we um, what we achieved so far uh, we could have uh, do more but also when you work on the ground and you you expect something to go this way and go the other way so um uh, i would say um, the project was a success <laughs> hopefully the other colleagues uh, uh, see that uh, that way too so uh, the interviews were um uh, particularly personal for me because I got to connect and hear the stories of uh, activists that I already knew in um, uh, in person or I, or I only knew about their work and it was a really good opportunity to connect with them and hear their story and their perspective in uh, in a way that couldn't be possible uh, other than the, the interviews. Uh, we we did uh, three interviews so far, one with uh, Haifa, one with Hamza, and one with uh, Rooney. Uh, unfortunately, she's not with us um, today. She's the uh, uh, Sudanese uh, activist and a filmmaker living in, in Berlin now. Uh, if I may say, the interviews also were like learning journey when we uh, we hear the story and uh, how activists from uh, different uh, countries and from different backgrounds uh, fight for their freedom and the, for, for the freedom of the, the things they, um, they believe in. And um, that, uh, that was uh, really incredible and brilliant. Uh, yeah, now that said, if I'm gonna talk about the political and the human rights situation in Tunisia that lead us to um, to do this project and to interview activists in exile. Uh, unfortunately, the human rights uh, situation in Tunisia and especially for queer community in Tunisia is uh, uh, de declining very, very, very fast, especially uh, on the last uh, two years after uh, the president Kais Saied took over all the power in uh, in the country, shutting down the parliament, writing a new constitution, and taking control of uh, the, the judiciary and legislative uh, branches of the um, uh, uh, and legislative uh, power of, uh, of the country. So now he's the person who writes the laws. He's the person who have the right to fire and hire uh, judges and say what uh, who go to jail and uh, who who get released which is uh, very uh, very very dangerous regarding uh, the history of uh, of Tunisia and uh, if i can say Tunisia has lived 10 years of not total democracy but uh, Nobody expects that Tunisia will go back uh, as uh, as it was or worse than uh, than it was uh, before the um, the revolution. One of the most uh, dangerous or uh, way of 
uh, or faces of uh, of oppression in Tunisia is uh, writing the new constitution that the president wrote by himself and the presidential uh, degrees. And uh, here I refer to the um, 54 degree that uh, the president issue and which uh, grant him the authority to uh, prosecute journalists, activists, uh, politician, or uh, anyone over a simple Facebook post or any declaration against him or his um, regime, which uh, really, really dangerous, especially when we talk about uh, freedom of expression and uh, uh, about uh, journalism and uh, media freedom and how uh, um, things are uh, are happening in the country and uh, how those uh, journalists and uh, human rights uh, activists and politicians are uh, fighting for uh, for the right of freedom of expression and with this new degree it grant the the president the right to put basically anyone on the on the on the prison only for a facebook post as um, as i mentioned uh even more concerning uh, in the new law regulation uh, that regula regulating, sorry, the civil society organization uh, and the like that forbid uh, foreign funding for NGOs. Um, so in Tunisia, uh, there is uh, a degree that uh, uh, regulates the work of civil society that was issued on 2011 after the revolution which is most of uh, civil society organization in the country uh, work under this um, this law. But now the president want to, uh, to write a new one and the danger of this new law that it will uh, prevent uh, civil society organization and especially queer organization from uh, working and um, advocating for the right of the communities uh, that they fight for and which will cut uh, foreign funding to those um, NGOs, which is the only mean of, uh, of funding in, um, in the country, and um, prosecute those organizations and uh, activists uh, for conspiracy uh, uh, complaint or something like that. And we have in Tunisia this uh, famous um, uh, case where civil uh, politician and uh, activists got um, got arrested and uh, went to to jail until uh, today only because of a claim uh, such as conspiracy against the state security without any evidence uh, only because they are uh, preceded and advertised to uh, to his re uh, to his regime or have uh, connection with the foreign um, embassies or NGOs or diplomats. And on that basis, uh, every civil, uh, every activist or politician can be arrested and prosecuted uh, under the conspiracy against the, the state security in, uh, in Tunisia. Um, yeah, I don't wanna take a lot of uh, space, but uh, overall, this is the, the situation of um, the political situation of the civil society in, uh, in Tunisia now. And we hope by um, the interviews we, um, we did to, uh, to give more voices and more platform to those activists to continue the work they, um, they used to do in their home country while uh, they're in exile now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Halit. Uh, with that, um, we'll hand over to Caroline. Yeah, thank you very much, Elena, and thank you, Khaled, for um, for that introduction. Um, I was asked to speak very briefly about the work of Democracy International, and I really want to keep it brief because there are so many people here who do such interesting stuff all around the world. So we really want to give them as much time as possible. Um, I really just wanted to to frame this discussion a little bit. So um, Democracy International is a German-based NGO, um, but we are active worldwide. Um, and we are dedicated to giving citizens more of a say in political decision-making. Um, and in that sense, we work mostly uh, on issues of direct democracy and citizen participation. Um, and especially around um, 
around the concept of direct democracy, there's sometimes a bit of confusion, also deliberately uh, deliberately created by um, by autocrats, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later or in a minute. Um, direct democracy for us is always um, a bottom-up tool. It's a grassroots tool. It's a tool that is used by the citizens and, and, um, and initiated by citizens. So when we talk about direct democracy, we talk about referendums that are initiated um, by citizens gathering signatures or that come out of citizens' assemblies, that come out of participatory processes. Um, and, and, and clearly, direct democracy can never be a top-down um, imposed thing um, where, where you sort of allow people to, to rubber stamp a decision that was basically already made. Um, and of course, when we talk about participatory tools and direct democracy, we also have to think about a democratic context. Um, these tools cannot exist, they, they don't exist in a vacuum. They don't, they can't exist or in, in, um, in situations where there is no press freedom, where there's no meaningful civil society, where there's no rule of law um, and where freedom of association is, is not allowed. Um, and as Khaled has, has just illustrated, um, the situation in Tunisia has changed on all of those um, on all of those elements very drastically um, in just a couple of years' time. Um, right, and so um, in in that sense, when we think about all of those things, um, Tunisia is 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 a very um, a very interesting and, and and unfortunately a very sad case um, in the, in the last years because it for a long time really was the beacon of hope. Um, coming out of the the Arab the, the birthplace of the Arab Spring um, and and really also um, for a long time a place where where it seemed like this had led to meaningful democratic where it had led to meaningful democratic reforms it it won um, Tunisian activists the Nobel Peace Prize in 2015 um, and and they came up with a their their constitution they they came up with a very participatory process that that was very bottom up um, to to write a new constitution after the dictatorship um, after the fall of the dictatorship of Ben Ali um, and this new constitution was launched or was written in 2014 or was approved in 2014 and, and came into effect in 2015 um, and um, it it's really bitter and and there's people here who can talk much better about this um, but just from our perspective it was really bitter to see that this constitute this democratically written constitution that was really um, written in a participatory and inclusive way, um, that it was replaced two years ago by a constitution that was written by one man, um, which in itself is just a it is it's, it's just a, a almost a, almost absurd, um, and uh, and of course there there was a referendum to validate this constitution which um, which also was was just I mean to call it bad practice was is also is is just it falls short of of um it's it's really a, a, an um something that we should condemn um and that that was um yeah just a, a very um a very very bitter end to um or not an end i hope but a very bitter evolution in um in 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 what happened in tunisia um yeah, and so um, it's in this context that we we started this project this year as a um, sort of a pilot project with with two young volunteers, uh, with four young volunteers. And I really want to thank uh, Elena Khaled, Antonia, and Hisham, who's not here today, um, because they've been yeah they they've been setting up this project as they explained and um, as they also said we we really hit. Uh, a big setback um, early on that that made uh, that that mean, meant that we had to change this entire project um, very drastically, and and so they've done an amazing job um, coming up with 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 new concepts and 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 making the best out of a out of a situation that was just really difficult, also due to the political situation in Tunisia. Um, and they've they've done these amazing interviews, and we'll now hear from from a lot of these people that they spoke with uh, in this webinar. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, and I just uh, really want to say so this is for us. This really falls under our core, um, our core mission as Democracy International. So so we don't just want to collect um, sort of good practices from around the world. Um, from countries where where things are are going well, but we also want to support activists. Um, who believe in democracy and who are working on on making their 
societies more democratic and 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 creating this democratic context um also in difficult situations um and so um in that sense i i'm i'm really happy and proud now to to hand the word to the to the next person so thank you so much and and looking forward to the discussion all right thank you then coming up next we have haifa haifa can you switch on your camera yes there we go all right okay hello uh, my name is haifa i am from uh, lebanon and i live now uh, in sweden last uh, one year um, when I am uh, talking about Lebanon, should be like we have a timeline for Lebanon. It's a little bit uh, long uh, because Lebanon, we have a lot of uh, every time we, uh, we have uh, something happening very strong, like but the activism and the organization will be start in the 2011 when you have like the war in the, in the Syrian and we have a lot of refugees come to, to Lebanon. Uh, the first will be focus uh, all this organization to help the refugees to uh, uh, help how to immigrate uh, this to uh, uh, Lebanese people and Syrian people and Palestinian people come also uh, from Syria to, uh, to Lebanon. Uh, but now uh, and in the 2018, we have this revolution in Lebanon. Um, and everything will be changed again. Before this, we have a little right uh, for the talking, for the uh, journalist, uh, a little bit for the LGBT community. It is still a crime in Lebanon, but we have like a little bit right to walk in the street, to talk, to uh, uh, put, um, to have like some places. It's very. Uh, um, especially for LGBT community, we have one organization in Lebanon uh, work for the right for LGBT community. But be like after the revolution, everything everything in Lebanon is a change and will be bad and bad and bad. Uh, like now, we have zero right for LGBT community. We have a lot of uh, groups make uh, activate violence activate uh, about the groups for LGBT community. And when you see any person in the street, and also we have a lot of um, uh, 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 like the power for the journalists now in Lebanon. It's very down, and uh, we cannot uh, talk or uh, all the uh, our right. Uh, when you want about the politics. Uh, and also because we have like a, a, a politics, a grand, uh, our big politics issues in Middle East, it's very affected about Lebanon, which is a small country. Uh, for all the time when you happened around Lebanon, it's happened also inside Lebanon. Uh, and we have this economy issues also in Lebanon. For all this uh, reflect about the organization Lebanon now to be like uh, uh, less uh, power, uh, less uh, money. <laughs> uh, uh, also all the activism it's try right to left Lebanon and we have a lot of international uh, organization left Lebanon and uh, a little bit now, all this image about the human rights in Lebanon is a change. I didn't know. Yes, we hear you, Haifa. From my side, um, I hear you. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so when you're talking about Lebanon now, we have like, before 2018, they didn't have any um uh, any violence action about the activism but now we have a lot of violence ac uh, violence action uh, we have the government now it's very affected and we um work to less the organization and all this organization work about the human right will be go down and down and down to affect it about the society in lebanon uh, and also we have like this a problem in Lebanon because all this organization, like um, uh, we have like the places in Beirut and for all the uh, villa uh, village or another places, they didn't have any organization work about the human rights or about the activism, about the LGBT queer, but should be you are in Beirut to 
have this right to like connect for this organization. A little bit of problem now about the activism because also Beirut, it's not like safe. We have Hezbollah. Um, it's very terrible time. And also we have this problem in Lebanon uh, about the, um, we're talking, <laughs> it's negative, negative, but about the reports because I try to write, I try, I, I, uh, to see the reports uh, in Lebanon, it is still very, very old, and they didn't have a new uh, reports about the situation for uh, Lebanon now, or what happened now. Because every time we have a change in Lebanon and the Middle East, there should be the organization work more about the reports, about uh, talking how, how what happened exactly. Uh, I think it's very important to have this uh, right image about the situation in Middle East and in my country, Lebanon. This is uh, what I want to talk about Lebanon. Okay, um, can you, before we move on, can you talk a little bit about um, organizations um, that work in Lebanon? Is that still possible even? Yeah, still we have like international and uh, international organization and um, uh, nationality organization in Lebanon. Like we have Save, uh, Save the Children, we have uh, Amnesty, uh, we have some organ, we have just one organization for LGBT. It's a national uh, uh, national organization, but they didn't have a right to. Uh, uh, to sing a paper or something. We have some organization, national organization work, uh, work about the right of women, but now they didn't have the power because all this, uh, uh, like uh, all this report, they talk like Lebanon now it's safe country. For all this organization focus for another places, it's not in Lebanon, but still in Lebanon, we have 1 million refugees from Syria. We have, uh, I didn't know the number ex exactly, Palestinian refugees. And also we have a lot of Lebanese, we have this uh, politics problem and economic pro uh, problem. What happened now, this organization, it's not focused about Lebanon, focus for another places. Uh, another places, this make the, uh, what we can talk, uh, they didn't have activities or we didn't have uh, a right to program about the children, about the uh, women in Lebanon. Still, they have a lot of women still. Uh, uh, still, they have a lot of children. They didn't go to the school. Uh, now we have a problem about the hospitality, uh, about the health, uh, health, uh, health, uh, Oh, uh, my healthcare. Healthcare. healthcare in Lebanon. Uh, yeah. When you're talking about economy and for the health, uh, like less uh, right, right, uh, less the human rights uh, for the people. We cannot like uh, now in Lebanon the organization focused to find like uh, food for the people, and still. The reports tell Lebanon it's a safe place and we can live like in the happy things. And we have many, 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 many people. They didn't have a safe place. They have many children. They didn't have like a legal home. So when you have like the winter coming, it's terrible for all the refugees, like Syrian refugees. Uh, we have a little of organization, but they didn't focus about Lebanon now. Like maybe because I know like we have terrible things in in the world also, but still Lebanon like it's not safe. Okay, then um, let's perhaps um, move on to Hamza, and then we can ask more questions after. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. As I. Uh, mentioned in the message, I'm Hamza Nasri, a queer political activist and the human rights defender from Tunisia, uh, exiled now in Sweden, Stockholm, uh, exactly. I'm a co-founder and the treasurer of Intersection Association for Rights and Freedom, which is a, a, a regional uh, based in Tunisia organization that works in the field of uh, research, uh, trainings, reporting, monitoring and documentation of human rights one of the very important pillar, if we can say that we work on that uh, uh, 
uh, we uh, work in favor and to empower uh, human rights defenders and especially human rights defenders at risk. Uh, so as mentioned before, uh, uh, Khaled mentioned or uh, the other colleagues mentioned, uh, since uh, 25th of July, 2021, uh, democracy developed in uh, the wrong way, if we may say in Tunisia, there is a backlash of democracy. Uh, our president, I say, took over all the power powers in his hand. Uh, when we say this, we at least from my side, I believe that uh, 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 the last decade before Tai Sai taken over all the power wasn't uh, the best uh, uh, model or the best success of Tunisia democracy, but uh, it was full of failures, full of uh, social, economic, political uh, 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 failures. Maybe uh, we had and we witnessed the uh, political assassination in uh, in the last. What we uh, we in intersection and civil society organization believe in that at least we had the platform of democracy. We started learning democracy uh, in, in, in in as the people as the elite as the uh, political and the civic component. Uh, so yes. Uh, since 25th of July 2021, uh, things escalated. Kai Said in the beginning took over all the power, then he dissolved our judicial council, which is uh, an independent uh, uh, one, and he nominated a new one uh, uh, with people he have control over. He uh, fired the 57 judge, and uh, even though the administrative court, which is a Supreme Court in Tunisia, uh, who uh, who uh, gave them the right to go back to work? He refused to execute this uh, this uh, judgment, and we believe that uh, he started by uh, uh, controlling uh, justice because he believes that uh, uh, in the atmosphere of fear that he's seeding into hearts and into environment, he needs uh, an instrumentalized justice in order to 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 build his dictatorship. Uh, also, uh, he uh, he asked the people if we need to uh, re readopt a new constitution, and uh, people said no. Uh, this is one of the funniest things that happened in Tunisia. He consulted people in a national consultancy, if we say, if we may say, and uh, people voted for no changing for the constitution. But even though he changed the constitution, he nominated a committee to write the new constitution and to propose the new constitution, but. Uh, then when he saw or he read what have been written by by this committee, he threw it. Up, he, he threw this proposal. He brought a new proposal written by him, and it was very dramatic. And the constitution from his jar in the front of everyone in the media, and proposing a, a new constitution in the last two days before the national consultancy. Uh, people do not do not uh, uh, vote for in favor and in favor of this new constitution. But even though he adopted this new version of the constitution, since uh, uh, what's alarming now and what's uh, uh, what's a little bit uh, uh, concerning and frustrating now, maybe more than the other things in Tunisia, that since eight months in February twenty twenty three. Uh, Qais Saeed uh, persecuted, uh, if we can say, the first uh, or the leaders of the political parties in Tunisia uh, from the left to the right. Uh, he didn't spare anyone. Uh, eight political leaders are uh, are in jail since uh, uh, since uh, February 2023. Two of them uh, was re released, if we can say. But the other, they are still in uh, in jail, and uh, and uh, uh, they are leading a hunger strike since ten days or more. And uh, I wanted to highlight this and what's happening now because we in the Tunisian uh, civil society and the political uh, uh, sphere in Tunisia, the democratic political sphere, we believe that uh, the health of uh, uh, the political leaders in, in 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 jail is a priority now. And that's why, for example, uh, uh, Intersection Association for Rights and Freedoms during this week is leading uh, uh, an advocacy a visit to uh, Stockholm and to Brussels in order to, to advocate first for Tunisia's future 
and second for uh, the freedom of uh, the political leaders in, in Tunisia. Uh, I tried to highlight what happened in, uh, in the last uh, eight months, and maybe I'll focus uh, uh, a little bit on the LGBTQI community situation. And if I'm taking too much time, please tell me. I'll, uh, I know that I don't stop if you don't tell me stuff. Yeah, so uh, the 110 year of, uh, of uh, criminalization of uh, queerness and homosexuality in Tunisia. Uh, uh, 110 years ago, uh, due to French colonialism, we adopted a law criminalizing homosexuality in Tunisia and condemning it with the three years of jail, five years of, uh, of uh, exiling from the city that you were caught in, and you may be uh, fined also with a fine, it's up maybe to 5,000 dinar, which is uh, 1,000. 300 euro. Yeah, we contextualize what's happening that we had uh, uh, big steps in the last decade in terms of uh, uh, queer rights in Tunisia. But what happened with the, the new development in democracy made us unable to achieve more successes. But now we're trying to maintain what we already achieved. This is the point when speaking about the uh, because I remember before the 25th of July 2021, we were speaking about decriminalizing uh, uh, homosexuality in Tunisia. Now our strategy is based on how to support legally, psychologically uh, 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 victims of uh, a human rights violation, of anal test, of uh, uh, arbitrary detention on, on the basis of uh, gender expression or uh, 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 sexual orientation. This briefly the situation of queer community in Tunisia. I may add uh, only one number. Uh, we uh, we asked the higher instance for jail and reform in Tunisia to give us numbers about uh, numbers of detainee uh, uh, on the ground of the Article 230 since the revolution until this year, and it varies between uh, 100 to 120 every year are uh, uh, caught in jail because of their. Uh, uh, gender identities, identities or sexual orientation. Uh, this is uh, when speaking about uh, queer rights in Tunisia. Uh, I may uh, highlight also our main project with an intersection, which is Freedom Faces. Freedom Faces is the first platform, uh, open source data uh, and open data accessible for uh, academics, uh, students, lawyers, uh, NGOs, international NGOs, and national NGOs that allow allows people to track, to to follow on a human rights violation that monitored and documented by by our uh, staff and team in Tunisia. It's uh, an updated uh, 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 database uh, that is accessible for everyone, and uh, uh, we believe since uh, we started Freedom Faces and we launched uh, Freedom Faces until now, we developed it a lot. Uh, we, uh, if we may say, we uh, conducted a lots of uh, changes on term of uh, our methodology and our, in term of our public uh, public that we uh, we cover. And now uh, we believe that uh, Freedom Faces it's one of the main sources of information in Tunisia. And uh, uh, when we say uh, uh, source of information, we we mean uh, uh, correct, uh, scientific, uh, neutral uh, way of uh, monitoring and documenting a human rights violation. Yeah, if we say reliable, yeah. I don't know if uh, I gave a clear idea. If, if there is any question, I'll be happy to answer. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Hamza. Uh, we'll move on to questions in a little bit. Um, I uh, yeah also just wanted to throw something in there like um we've talked a lot about queer rights um just now and um everyone who's familiar with Democracy International's work knows that the main focus of Democracy International is of course democracy. Um, the thing is that um the most potent indicator for whether a country has um, queer rights or not is not 
cultural or economic factors, which are often discussed, but actually uh, what political system a country has. In fact, um, most countries that criminalize homosexuality um, have a rather low score on the democracy, like the Economist's Democracy Index. Um, and it's also noticeable that in places where democracy stalls or is backrolled, um, or where the third wave of um, democratization, like the wave that happened during the last quarter of the 20th century, stalled or didn't quite happen. Um, one example of this is Russia. Um, queer rights are um, rather poor, let's say. Um, but yes, um, before we move on to the discussion round, I wanted to ask Mr. De Bono, would you like to um, tell us a little bit about your work? Um, sure, can you hear me? Okay, um, well, basically, what, uh, what's, well, I have to hold my hands up, uh, as noble a cause as it is, and, and as interesting as it is, um, LGBTIQ, issues are not what I concentrate on. Um, um, what interested me um, is basically I saw through my own preliminary pilot research, but as well that was consolidated by other research that came out, and Arab Barometer is one of them, for instance. Um, I was pretty surprised to see that um, upon his power grab, Kais Syed um, was was seemingly backed by a large segment of the Tunisian electorate. And um, that brings a lot of questions about the notion of democratic responsiveness. And that's what I'm looking at. Um, basically, uh, that tells me that the, you really have to make a distinction between, you really have to make a distinction between types of democracy or else um, different ways that, that people look at democracy, right? Um, uh, some people view democracy in terms of its institutions as a product of, of, of its um, various institutions like um, civil rights and uh, civil and political rights and having a democratic constitution and having free and fair elections and so on and so forth. But we've seen time and again um, uh, countries that have all that in place. But when it comes to the, the normative aspects of democracy, when it comes to, um, uh, when you ask yourself, why is democracy desirable, right? It's because there's no arbitrary rule, it's because it's the, it's the so-called rule of the people, it's because the, the desires of the majority of a population get, um, uh, get translated into policy and so on and so forth. And that aspect of democracy is sometimes completely absent when the other aspect of democracy, all the institutions, all the free and fair elections and people choosing their leaders and there being civil and political rights, that's all present. And uh, it seems to me that that's what happened in Tunisia. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking into basically what uh, the period 2011 till, till July 2021, and I'm looking at uh, what why there was a lack of democratic responsiveness in Tunisia on behalf of the transitional governments. Um, my project in, in its infancy, I've written three draft chapters at this point, um, uh, even though I've been at it since the beginning of 2020 on a part-time basis, but uh, I must say it's extremely interesting up to, up, up to this point. Um, and I have my suspicions as to what prevented um, uh, democratically elected governments from um, not heeding to the demands of the Tunisian population. Um, would you like to elaborate directly? Well, there are, well, I've looked at the literature extensively up to now, and there are a vast array of reasons that. Um, that different academics put forward as to as to what could have hindered the democratic responsiveness. Um, but I think one is pretty overwhelming, and that is um, basically the economic development model that uh, that Tunisia 
experienced after independence under Habibul Giba, basically, was an economic model. It was a particular economic model that we saw in many, many places all over the world. I mean, I'm, I'm from Malta. We experienced exactly the same economic model at the same time. Um, uh, it's called an import substitution industrialization. Okay, it's an it's a economic model that in which um, there's basically heavy heavy investment from from the government into health, into education. There, there's there's develop, economic development spurred by the government internally, right? Um, that all changed basically when 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 Ben Ali came to power. I mean, it it, it the infitah started the, the opening up. Um, started under Bourguiba in the last years of, of Habib Bourguiba, but um, intensified under Ben Ali. And in fact, there was the first um, uh, structural adjustment program signed under the auspices of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, just before the, the nonviolent, what they call the medical coup, when Ben Ali came to power, basically. Um, now, the economic model, that changed Tunisia's economic model from one of import substitution industrialization to basically a neoliberal economic model of export-led growth, you know. Um, uh, eventually in 95, then Tunisia was heavily tied to the European Union and so on and so forth. So to cut a long story short, because I'll, I'll go on forever, okay. Um, to, the, there, was an ec there was a particular economic model in place in Tunisia from 1987 up until basically, um, 2000 and the end of 2010 2011 which is when when uh, when the uprisings took place um which many have come to say many economists many activists many 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 academics have come to say is what actually led to the situation that um that spurred the uprisings to begin with um that economic model uh, was not changed I mean, in the beginning, when 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 Nahda was was vying for power, it had, there was no elections yet. You know, there was still um, uh, Esebsi as interim prime minister. So, in the period between between the uprisings and October 2011, when the NCA was elected, um, so there was a period. That was a period which which. In, in which the fate of of the of the country in terms of its econ economic model uh, was already written prior to any election having taken place. Um, there was a, a very important deal signed um, called the the Jasmine Plan, um, with uh, a number of international donors. Okay, the, the the G8, all of them, the Gulf states, and it was an, uh, the IMF, the, the World Bank. Um, which basically ensured that the economic model that was present from 1987, you know, for, for 20, 23 years it is, for 23 years prior to the uprisings, does not change, remains in place. In fact, is, is intensified rather, you know. And that economic model makes the, well, satisfying the, the, the main socioeconomic demands of the Tunisian people, impossible. It's not conducive to those uh, to those kind of uh, to satisfying those kinds of demands. So that's uh, not set in stone. It's not a fact. Um, that's my opinion. It's, in fact, it's my hypothesis, uh, and uh, that's what I'm investigating really. All right, thank you. Um, there have been no questions posted in the chat yet. Um, I do encourage you to do so, um, all of our participants, but until then, I'll just go ahead and ask some questions. Um, let me scroll through my notes. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, Haifa, can you um, tell us a little bit about your activism? Like what made you first interested? Um, and in what ways were you able to be politically active in Lebanon and also now? Uh, actually, I am actors and I make a master preparing uh, actor 
but uh, my field in the uh, activism, how to using theater to help the people to express, to talk, to uh, uh, know more about the human rights, uh, human right, uh, and uh, everything in Lebanon like push the people to uh, to talk and to do th things about the politics and economic and everything in Lebanon. Uh, I start uh, my work and my project in Lebanon, like a small theater in uh, Palestine in uh, Shatila. It's a small camp in Lebanon for the Palestinian refugees. And I'm using this place uh, to help the women's uh, LGBT queer uh, community and the children to make a group to be safe, like a safe place in the uh, little bit uh, terrible place <laughs> in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, uh, and I uh, use this uh, method like uh, with the theater, uh, how to get, how, I didn't know how to talking. Uh, how to know the people? How you can the people make oppression or make express to know more about the uh, body? And for me, like when the working about the theater work about the group and the politics things is a group. When we have a group, a strong group, they know the human right and they express each other. We can express everything. For me, like for the first things, I think the politics just go to the street and fight and fight and fight. But when I see like the big image in Lebanon uh, and I feel, no, maybe if I work in the small group and we have this change with the same uh, small group, we make more effort because I cannot help all the Lebanon. I cannot help uh, all the people in the street. I cannot uh, like still like just one sound, but I can make about the theater, make efforts. If you have like one group here in Shatila, one group in my village, it's a small village in the South. If I work in uh, some uh, school and with the, also group with the children, for me, this group will be affected because this group it's very strong and we can make a change uh, together. So this is like uh, my method for the democratic and politics things. But for me, like the small group may, maybe will be affected more for the image in Lebanon or in the uh, places they didn't have government help the people for the human rights and they didn't respect the human rights. Uh, should be like... Uh, uh, make the beginning, like the beginning for the small group know the rights for the first to uh, and respect the group, uh, they respect the group, they respect, respect the human rights, and this is more effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, directly tying into that, we have ooh, two questions. Uh, the first one from Joe Matthews. And he's asking, can you discuss the state of democracy at the local level in towns and cities? Are people still able to self-govern at that level? Uh, let's maybe begin with uh, Hamza. Um, what's the situation like in Tunisia there? Yes, thank you for the question. And <clears throat> we believe that uh, in Tunisia, we started the process of what you call decentralization um, during the last decade. Uh, and for me, at least uh, personally, I believe that uh, the best thing about the last decade is the decentralization is voting for uh, lo localities and regional uh, 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 councils that represent really people. Uh, maybe because of the lack of resources, they didn't succeed in the best way. But it was, uh, if we can say, a lab for democracy, a lab for uh, for uh, for. Uh, for, uh, for different component to work together because there is no uh, this uh, if we can say there is no this uh, uh, pressure of national politics uh, uh, topics so we witnessed it that people from the right and people from the left working together in 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 lo uh, locals uh, uh, local level and uh, uh, for example for ecology for uh, for, for uh, de economic development and for stuff like this. Unfortunately, uh, what's happening now that uh, Pai Said, as he dissolved the parliament, all the instances of the country, all the institutions, uh, he dissolved also 
the uh, elected uh, elected uh, uh, if we say uh, elected uh, lo locality or uh, communes yes communes i was looking for the for the word yes so he uh, dissolved all the communes he uh, changed our uh, 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 election regime and he redistributed how uh, how uh, communes are uh, are uh, divided or uh, borders of the changed and uh, we uh, uh, and he banned political parties from running in, in the local local level. so uh, only individuals are allowed to 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 uh, to, to to run in this election so uh, also in terms of uh, the atmosphere, it's not an atmosphere for a, a fair, a, a fair, just, uh, equitable election because of all what happening, uh, uh, the the political uh, detention of uh, political leaders, the ban of, uh, for example, uh, uh, the class. Uh, uh, so I think on the, the local level, uh, people engagement toward democracy and uh, uh, in favor of democracy uh, shrinked uh, as like uh, all the civic space in Tunisia shrinked since 2021. Uh, okay, thank you. And then if we ask the same question to Haifa, um, you lived in both Tunisia and Lebanon. Like, what's it like in Lebanon, and what's perhaps um, things you noticed in you know the difference between Lebanon and Tunisia in that regard? Uh, yeah. Uh, like um, now, Lebanon and Tunisia live in the same situation. Uh, but uh, Lebanon before before after uh, two thousand eighteen, a little bit we have like. Uh, uh, a little bit more human rights, but I like Tunisia just for uh, one thing, because uh, the people know what happened in Tunisia, and they know, okay, Tunisia now it's bad place, but in Lebanon still the people, they didn't have this uh, power to tell, okay, now they didn't have human rights in Lebanon, and should be open the eyes and work more and more and work together to more, to like, uh, uh, come back, it's not come uh, on, come back to the human rights and come back to the express, to the all the rights for the people, for the activism, for the LGBT, for the children. Uh, what happened in Tunisia, I see like the same image between Lebanon and Tunisia, but the organization in uh, Tunisia or the people in Tunisia, they know now it's a bad time in Tunisia and we work together for help this to to go in uh, to go on and um, also like uh, it's a little bit different because in lebanon we have like 18 religion and we have many 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 politics uh, groups and in tunisia just we have like the people fight uh, between the Qais society or the government and the organization and when in lebanon they didn't know they have many groups and we cannot like just they did we cannot like just fight the government should be uh, fight the government fight the church fight the religion fight uh, everything to like uh, to have like the same right for all the people because if you are Lebanese and you are Muslim or you are Duruz or you are Christian, it's different. It's not the same for all the Lebanese. They didn't have the same right. They didn't have the, between the government. A little bit in Tunisia, all the people the same and just we have like problem with the government. This a little bit help to understand it just. Okay, thank you. Um, since there's been no more questions, I'm just going to go ahead and ask my own. Um, um, so this seminar is, a uh, webinar is also called, uh, sort of direct democracy and the role of the EU. And especially with Tunisia, there's been a recent development, namely a migration deal between the EU and Tunisia, which was mainly supported by Meloni in, um, Italy's right wing, um, president. So, um, 
Uh, Hamza, could you talk, or um, also Mr. Dabono or Khaled, could you talk a little bit about that, um, about that deal and what it means? Yeah, if no one is speaking, I'll maybe I'll start. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this week, Intersection Association, uh, in partnership with the Tunisian League for Human Rights Defense, which is the oldest and biggest organization in terms of human rights defense in Tunisia, and the Nobel Prize winner in 2015, uh, among other uh, civil society organizations, such as uh, the Tunisian Association for Democratic Women, and uh, Tunisia Young Leaders and other organizations are uh, co uh, co leading uh, a visit advocacy visit to Sweden and the Brussels. And while we're speaking now, my colleagues are in meetings in the European Parliament and with the European uh, MPs. And uh, uh, what uh, why we are doing this because we believe that. Uh, uh, yes, the European Union is the, the strategic partner of Tunisia, and Tunisia is a strategic partner for the European Union. Uh, but uh, we are a little bit disappointed. Uh, disappointed because uh, during the last decade, the uh, real investment happened in terms of uh, a strategic relationship between uh, EU and Tunisia. And we thought that uh, uh, the position of EU would be more uh, severe, strict, uh, straight, uh, tough in terms of preserving democracy in Tunisia. We thought that uh, uh, what happened with Ben Ali regime and uh, 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 forgetting about the human rights and uh, uh, trading the human rights with uh, migration uh, and security uh, issues in in uh, in EU will not will never happen again. But uh, we are reproducing the same uh, framework, if we can say, or uh, the same format. Of relationship, uh, uh, EU uh, wants to externalize the borders of EU uh, to Tunisia and want Tunisia to play the role of the police of frontier of EU, uh, even if this means uh, that uh, human rights are not respected, freedoms are not respected, the rule of law is not respected in Tunisia. The most important for EU states, I think. Uh, uh, it's to externalize the border and protect the, the borders from uh, from uh, migration. Uh, in in that, I believe not the position of all EU states are the same. Uh, we believe that uh, some states are less calculating in term of uh, uh, in term of uh, uh, interest or benefits than the others. Uh, 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 Today, uh, Italy is leading the camp of people, uh, uh, if we say, uh, uh, legitimizing Qaisaid, uh, 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 trying to, to financially help Qaisaid, to find solution to Qaisaid regime. That's why, for example, we choose Sweden maybe as a first destination because we know that uh, uh, the calculation are a little bit less in terms of... Uh, in terms of migration issues, uh, as we mentioned, and as we mentioned, as I mentioned now, and we mentioned to 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 people that we met during this week, that we that we are really disappointed. Uh, we're not demanding for for sanctions, for example. We're not demanding for uh, for uh, intervention, direct intervention, but we're demanding uh, of our partner and uh, our allies in in the international community to stand for the Tunisian democracy because we believe that it's a win-win uh, relationship when Tunisia is de development, developing in the right way, when democracy is uh, 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 developing in Tunisia, uh, Tunisia can be the platform of democracy, of human rights, of peace processes in the region. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and also on that note, um... There have been news, I believe this July it was, of um, sub-Saharan, mostly sub-Saharan migrants in Tunisia being um, deported into the desert bordering regions between um, Tunisia and uh, Libya, I believe it was. And um, 
4,000 migrants, um, according to my memory, were just brought into the desert without food, water, or shelter. Um, personally, like I did follow the news um, for a while, but um, there wasn't so much reporting done here in in our uh, news cycles. Can you talk a little bit about that? What the what the situation on that was and the development? Yes, yes, I uh, yes. Uh, I'm a little bit ready for all the questions because during this week we was uh, <laughs> answering all type of questions. So yes, uh, in 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 February of this year, uh, I said uh, gathered what we call the National Security Council in Tunisia, and he claimed that uh, there is a, a, a changing theory, theory or agenda targeting Tunisia. Uh, Western countries want to exchange uh, the Arab Muslim people of Tunisia by Black African Christian people, uh, and this uh, incited or uh, initiated uh, uh, something. I don't know how to say it uh, in, in 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 English, but in French we say chasse à la sorcière, uh, witch campaign, hunt. witch hunt. Yes, witch hunt against our brothers and sisters from sub-Saharan countries. We witnessed people living in the street, uh, houses bur burned, uh, uh, people beaten, uh, even killed in some cases. Uh, if, if people was were thrown in the desert in the middle of nowhere uh, 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 just because of their uh, color of, of skin. One of the most frustrating things, for example, that Tunisian citizens were at, were attacked and uh, displaced because they were black Tunisians. Uh, uh, so we believe that Kai uh, Saeed have two narratives: uh, narrative uh, for 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 uh, for uh, European and a narrative for Tunisian, or more than uh, this, uh, because uh, because of what Kai Saeed said and what his uh, 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 militia did for sub-Saharan African. The numbers of people illegally uh, leaving Tunisia and uh, uh, heading to Europe and to Italy increased. Uh, the Tunisian Forum for Social and Economic Rights uh, monitored the increase of level of uh, and flows of uh, of illegal migration or uh, irregular migration. Uh, 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 that's why we said Kais Haid have two narratives: narrative for Europe that he's protecting the borders. Narrative inside that he should throw those migrants in the sea or uh, uh, push them back to their uh, to their country. The situation of migrants it's very 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 catastrophic in Tunisia. Since months, people are living in the streets. Uh, 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 civil society organizations are drained. To be honest, really uh, uh, drained because of all the efforts that uh, is done uh, internally in terms of what's happening in Tunisia for Tunisia but also for for our brothers and sisters from sub-Saharan countries. What is the general response of um, of Tunisians? Um, are people like, what's going on there? Like, yeah, to be honest, uh, when speaking about the sub-Saharan migration uh, to Tunisia, I think uh, the common or the general atmosphere, it's really bad and disappointing and uh, uh, make me, at least me as a migrant to another country feel. I remember the first day when Kais Haid spoke in, uh, in the National Security Council was the first time I feel uh, afraid because I'm living outside my country. I was going back home and I was thinking I'm living here in this country for a year and a half. I was feeling safe. I have never thought that locals may, for example, hurt me or target me or beat me or whatever it happened. But this day I felt frightened, uh, afraid. And I was literally walking on the street and looking to my shoulders. I don't know why. And then I felt like uh, how to be a sub-Saharan African in, in Tunisia now. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, one of the very bad things that happened. My mom called me. My mom lived in the in the countryside of Tunisia, 
and when this uh, witch hunt campaign started, people start fleeing big cities and uh, uh, heading to, to the south in order to cross the border to Libya, in order to go from Libya to Italy, and they was working on feet from uh, Tunis, Tunis or uh, Suez or Sfax and everything, and uh, it's not a general general uh, model, but uh, mom tried to give some food and water for uh, for people and other people uh, banned her from doing this and uh, didn't allow her to do this. That's why we believe sometimes that Qaisai succeeded in seeding this uh, the seed of uh, of fear, of uh, uh, xenophobia, of uh, uh, of hatred uh, with his hate speech and uh, uh, negative stereotypes and all of that. So yeah, uh, from my point of view, I think that uh, the general atmosphere is not in favor of uh, uh, sub-Saharan migrants in, in in Tunisia. Yeah, that's sounds horrifying. Like also speaking as um a German like that sounds horribly familiar. Um, does anyone have a question they would like to ask also from the team? Okay. Um, Scrolling through my own questions here to see if there's anything open. Okay, um, I believe then perhaps we can wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for to everyone for being here, um, for speaking and for joining this event. Um. Yeah, I wish everyone a yeah, a beautiful evening and a good start into the weekend as well. Um and then all right. Thank you for the opportunity and hope to see you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.